In engineering, we sometimes need to determine how much are the magnitude of stresses and strain at a certain point in our structure. One way to do that is installing a strain gauge on a surface of the element. Strain gauges are the elements or the tools that can determine or measure the magnitude of strain, the magnitude of the normal strain in a certain direction. Unfortunately, we cannot directly determine the magnitude of stresses, but if we determine the magnitude of strains, then using the generalized Hooke's law, we can determine the magnitude of stresses at that point. One more fact about strain gauges is that there is no way for us to determine the magnitude of shear strain at a certain point. We are just able to determine the magnitude of normal strains. But if we want to determine the overall state of strain at a certain point, we should be able to determine how much is the magnitude of shear strain at that point. What we want to do today is we want to put different strain gauges in different directions to be able to determine state of strain and state of stress at a certain point. In other words, we want to be able to determine how much are the magnitude of stresses and strain at a certain point using just this tool, which is able to determine strain in one direction. Okay? Before talking about the theoretical part, let me show you some examples. Those of you who are taking the lab, you have seen some of those strain gauges in some of the elements. You have worked with some of them. Those are tiny, small elements that are attached to the surface of an element and are measuring the magnitude of small deformations that might be caused by temperature, by force, or any other thing. Assume that we have one strain gauge which is able to measure how much is strain in one direction. Our goal is we want to determine strains in that point in x, y, also shear strain. To be able to do that, we need to have at least three strain gauges because we have three components in one point. Remember that while we are talking about surface of an element, that would be plane stress situation. And in a plane stress situation, we have three independent components, sigma x, sigma y, tau xy, and similarly, epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. So three independent components. To be able to determine those three independent components, we need to have three strain gauges. You can see example of one real strain gauge or strain rosette in the figure as shown here. What we do is we read the magnitude of strain in each of these three gauges and then use strain transformation equation to determine how much is epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. Assume that strain in the a direction is measured. Let's call it epsilon a. If we know how much is epsilon x and epsilon y and gamma xy in the xy plane, we can determine how much is epsilon a from stress transformation equation. And that equation is shown here. Remember, for the strain transformation equation, I gave you two similar or two equivalent equations. The top one is the one that we usually use, which is in terms of two theta. The bottom one is more suitable for our analysis here, which is in terms of theta. Both of these two equations are giving us the same value. They are equivalent to each other. If I want to determine epsilon a, what should I use as theta for that strain gauge? Theta would be angle of strain gauge A with the horizontal direction, with the x-axis. So here, I have to use theta A. Similar to that, I can write down epsilon B and epsilon C using the same strain transformation equation, right? The angle for all of these gauges would be their angle from the positive direction of x, as shown here. How many unknowns do we have? We have epsilon x, we have epsilon y, and gamma xy. How many equations do we have? Three. So we would have three equations, three unknowns, and we can solve it. Okay? That's the way we want to solve and determine state of strain at a certain point. Um, one more equation is this one, which gives us the magnitude of strain in out-of-plane 
It is just giving how much is strain in the z direction. And if you want to determine that, we can just use this equation. So let's solve a problem and see how can we use these equations to solve a real world example. On the free surface of an aluminum component, the strain rosette shown in the figure was used to obtain the following normal strain data. Epsilon A is negative 300 micro epsilon, epsilon B is 735 micro epsilon, and epsilon C is 410 micro epsilon. Determine the state of stress at that point. Also determine the principal normal stresses and maximum in plane shear stress. Also draw the stress element. Okay, I'm gonna write down the parameters that we have. The aluminum has the modulus of elasticity of 10,600 KSI. The Poisson's ratio is 0 0.35, and I can determine G from this equation. G is E divided by two multiplied by one plus nu, and that would be 39.25 KSI. To solve this problem, what we have are epsilon A, B, and C. We need to convert them into epsilon X, Y, and Z using the strain transformation equation. Then, using the generalized Hooke's law, we need to determine stresses and then determine the principal stresses. So these are the steps that we need to take here. All right, let me start with determining strains in the X and Y direction. Okay, epsilon N is epsilon x cosine squared of theta plus epsilon y sine squared of theta plus gamma xy sine theta cosine theta. For strain gauge A, what is the angle that I should use? How much is the angle of A with the positive direction of x? So looking into that strain gauge, theta A would be the angle of strain gauge A with the x-axis. That would be 90 minus 60, which is 30 degrees. How much would I use as a theta for B? That would be 90 degrees. Theta B is 90 degrees. What about theta for C? It is 60 plus 90 because we need to determine that from the positive direction of the x-axis. So that would be 150 degrees, right? So with that, I'm going to plug them into this equation. The theta A would be 30 degrees. Reading for A is negative 300 micro epsilon. And I'm just going to use theta equal to 30 and plug them into this equation. For B, theta is 90 degree, cosine of 90 degree is 0, and sine is 1. So that simplifies to 735 equal to 0 plus epsilon y plus 0. Okay? And for C, we have 150, and we get 410, and this one. All right? Now, we have three equations and three unknowns. Then, we need to solve it, and if I solve that, we get epsilon x negative 172, epsilon y 735, and gamma xy negative 820. These are the magnitude of strains at that point. So we have determined strains at that point. What is the next step? We need to determine stresses at that point. To determine stresses, we need to use the generalized Hooke's law. This is the case of two-dimensional plane stress because we have applied strain gauge on a surface of an element. So I'm going to use stress and strain equations for 2D plane stress case, and I simply plug the values that we have of E, nu, epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. And with that, I would get sigma x equal to 1030 psi, as shown here. Sigma y is calculated to be 8150 psi, as shown here. And tau xy would be negative 3220 psi, as shown here. So this is the state of stress for that point. But this is not the final answer we are looking for. We need to determine principal stresses. Principal stresses are calculated from this equation. Sigma P1 and P2 are sigma x plus sigma y over 2. I just plug the values. Plus and minus. Sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus tau xy squared. And if I do that, I would get negative 210 and positive 9390 PSI. And I can draw that here. On the principal plane, we have these two stresses. This is the state of principal stress. 
Do we expect to see any shear stress at this element? No, because that is the principal plane. Now, let's determine the very last part. How much is the maximum shear stress? That would be sigma P1 minus sigma P2 over 2, and that would be 4800 PSI. And if I draw that on this element, that would be like this. Do we expect to see any normal stress on this element? There might be. Sigma average would be simply sigma x plus sigma y over 2. And if I do that, I will get 4590 PSI.